Hello, everyone, and welcome back to History of Sexuality. As you know, this week in class, we're focusing on the Kinsey Studies. In our last lecture, we set the stage for this by talking about America's post-war sexual discourse. As we saw, during the 1950s, discussions about sex were increasingly entering the public arena, in the media, in literature, in the movies, and in academia. Many commentators worried about the increasing sexualization of American culture, which they thought would damage the country's moral standards and diminish the United States' standing in the eyes of the international community. So how did these pre-existing concerns impact the way Americans read and reacted to the Kinsey reports? What kind of reception did Kinsey's research meet with? And what impact did the publication of Sexual Behavior in the Human Male from 1948 and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female from 1953 have on ongoing discussions of sexual morality and on the various laws, norms, and standards that regulated American sexual conduct in the mid-20th century U.S.? These are some of the questions we're going to tackle today, in addition to those on the screen. But before getting into this, it might help to know something about Kinsey himself. Born in 1894 in Hoboken, New Jersey, Kinsey grew up in a poor, deeply Christian household. In matters of religion, his parents were said to be strict and puritanical. It is unknown exactly how his religious upbringing impacted his early views of sexuality, though some speculate that the sexual dilemmas of his own youth gave him a great deal of sympathy for other people's sexual struggles. From, an, from a young age, Kinsey displayed an aptitude for biology, and after obtaining several degrees in the subject, in 1920, he gained employment at Indiana University as an assistant professor of zoology. Kinsey's early career was built on research into the gall wasp, a subject on which he became America's leading expert. But in 1938, his career took a dramatic turn. In that year, Kinsey was chosen to coordinate a newly established class on marriage at Indiana University. In his lectures, he railed against the contemporary state of American sexual mores, arguing that these gave young men and women totally inaccurate understandings of sex and contributed to marital dissatisfaction and high rates of divorce. Among other things, Kinsey believed that by preventing people from having sex before marriage, the country's sexual morals made the achievement of successful marriage almost impossible. In the summer of 1938, Kinsey began taking the sexual histories of his students. Within a year, he had begun scheduling interviews outside the university as well. The results of these early studies were incredibly revealing. Kinsey believed that he was sitting on a scientific gold mine, and in 1940, he received a grant from the Committee for Research in the Problems of Sex. This provided the funding needed to interview thousands upon thousands of Americans about their sex lives. And so as to provide an institutional basis for this, in 1947, the Institute for Sex Research, later simply known as the Kinsey Institute, was founded at Indiana University. Kinsey's goal was to study sex scientifically. Hoping to gain quantitative information about this subject, he measured sexual activity in terms of orgasms and counted the incidence and frequency of these through six different sexual outlets, masturbation, nocturnal emissions, heterosexual petting, penile vaginal intercourse, homosexual activity, and sex with animals. This behavior was analyzed in terms of race, sex, age, marital status, educational level, occupational class, geography, religious affiliation, and family upbringing. The first of Kinsey's studies derived from interviews with over 5,000 American men. Published in 1948, it was called Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. In 
and at the time, it was the largest, most detailed study of human sexuality ever conducted. In the introduction to the volume, Kinsey wrote that, in the past, it would have been impossible to conduct this kind of research. But, because Americans were now becoming more and more open to discussing their sexual experiences, the time was right, he wrote, for, quote, a thoroughly objective, fact-finding investigation of sex. His goal was to gather data about men's sexual activities in a way that was completely divorced from questions of moral value and social custom. As he put it, the purpose of the book was, quote, to bring an educated intelligence into the consideration of such matters as sexual adjustments in marriage, the sexual guidance of children, the premarital sexual activities which are in conflict with the mores and problems confronting persons who are interested in the social control of behavior through religion, custom, and the forces of the law. Five years later, in 1953, Kinsey published a follow-up volume, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. This second volume was even more filled with data than its predecessor. It was based on interviews with nearly 8,000 American women. When it was published, it received even more attention than the first study. It revealed similar findings. High rates of premarital coitus and a rate of extramarital sexual intercourse of around 50%. But perhaps because this research dealt with women, sexual behavior in the human female was also condemned much more fervently than Kinsey's study of male sexuality. Kinsey's goal was to provide an objective, dispassionate understanding of what he called average American sexuality. But the reaction to his research was anything but dispassionate. Many were intensely critical. According to Life magazine, for example, the first volume was, quote, an assault on the family as a basic unit of society, a negation of moral law, and a celebration of licentiousness. Those who agreed with this view blamed Kinsey for promoting immorality and thought that his publications encouraged premarital sex, adultery, homosexuality, and would corrupt the nation's children. Those who were critical of Kinsey attacked him from four different perspectives, the religious, the moral, the nationalistic, and the psychoanalytic. Many of the most heated denunciations of him came from religious leaders, many of whom found his work anti-biblical, and they disliked how he focused on the physiological aspects of sex alone, neglecting some of the emotions, like love, for example, that were often part of sex. Psychiatrists, for their part, also often criticized Kinsey for failing to include any qualitative data in his study. Many clinicians, calmly, uh, many clinicians attacked him for calmly accepting behaviors, like homosexuality, that they saw as pathological. Nationalistic critics assailed him for undercutting the, the country's prestige. After reading the studies, for example, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI, cast Kinsey as anti-American, writing that, quote, whenever the American people, young or old, come to believe there is no such thing as right or wrong, normal or abnormal, those who would destroy our civilization will applaud a major victory over our way of life. Often, Kinsey's critics joined forces in unexpected ways. For example, the anti-Kinseyan tract I Accuse Kinsey from 1957 contained contributions from conservative clergy members, from gynecologists, from psychoanalysts, and from political officials. While they varied in their dislike of Kinsey's research, they all agreed that his reports were, as this volume put it, quote, dangerous to the mental, moral, and physical health of the country. However, not all saw things this way. Some praised Kinsey for helping Americans overcome their sexual squeamishness and believed that his research would help bring an end to the conspiracy of silence they saw surrounding sex. As an example of this, consider the reaction of Harry Benjamin, 
a sex researcher who believed that Kinsey's volumes had the power to emancipate Americans from their sexual chains. As he put it, quote, Lincoln freed the slaves from their shackles. The work of Kinsey and his collaborators should be a powerful factor in freeing human society from fantastic tribal taboos, from ecclesiastic prejudices, and from the savagery of medieval laws. This may indeed be known as the Alfred C. Kinsey age. Agreeing with this, the psychoanalyst Albert Deutsch called Kinsey's studies, quote, a powerful battering ram against the accumulated sex taboos of centuries. While some disputed Kinsey's data, others were less alarmed. Indeed, for decades, sexologists had believed that rates of premarital and extramarital heterosexual intercourse were on the rise, and that American sexual practices were becoming more varied, expanding to include things like oral sex, petting, and mutual masturbation. While some were outraged to read that almost 50% of American men had participated in homosexual activities to the point of orgasm, many sexologists agreed that this too was on the rise and were less shocked. How did the Kinsey studies fit into the broader reshaping of sexuality in the post-war U.S.? And more particularly, what impact did his studies have on laws and regulations surrounding sexual behavior? One of the most interesting things about the Kinsey studies was that they had relatively little to say about public sex. Kinsey's reports rarely mentioned exhibitionists, tea room sex between gay men, which he frequently encountered, prostitution, and other forms of sex in the cinema or other public venues. Indeed, the upshot of Kinsey's findings was that sex was a primarily private affair, something that took place solely in the comfort of an individual's home. Oddly, this omission of public sex was never brought up by any of Kinsey's critics, though it seems to have been part of a deliberate strategy devised by Kinsey himself. Indeed, it appears that part of Kinsey's goal was to use science to undermine many of the laws and statutes that regulated private sexual morality, for example, by prohibiting things like extramarital sex, sodomy, and sex between consenting minors. In this sense, Kinsey was a kind of moral crusader, someone who fought to modify those morals that he thought were out of touch with Americans' actual sexual behaviors. And in the aftermath of the publication of his volumes, legal organizations like the American Law Institute picked up on Kinsey's insights, and fought for the decriminalization of those sexual practices that did not offend public sentiments or morality. The, the success of these efforts can be seen in the Supreme Court's 1965 decision in Griswold v. Connecticut, which declared that as contraception was a matter of private concern between couples, the state possessed no power to regulate access to it. In this sense, we could say that Kinsey's research contributed to the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s by initiating the rollback against state intervention into people's private sexual lives. As this suggests, Kinsey definitely fits the bill of a moral crusader. Undoubtedly, he helped move America away from the repressive tenets of Victorian sexual culture and into the much more permissive and tolerant values of the modern era. Yet, while he accepted and normalized allegedly deviant practices like premarital sex and homosexuality, in some ways Kinsey was quite conventional. He clung to rather traditional ideas about personal relationships and certain social institutions. Unable to divorce himself from the notion of stable heterosexual unions, Kinsey saw his research as a means of shoring up that rather rocky institution that was marriage. Indeed, like many of his contemporaries, Kinsey was attached to the ideal of happy, stable marriages. By helping Americans become better adjusted to the idea of permanent monogamy, he believed his research would safeguard the institution of heterosexual marriage. In this sense, his sexual order was quite conservative. Though an emancipatory figure, he did not see sexual liberation as a means of overturning America's most cherished institution. 
Thanks for watching and listening to this lecture. There's obviously a lot more we could talk about, but this gives us a good place to start.